Tell your neighbor, he's working in you. Proverbs chapter 29, in verse 2, and the scripture reads this way. It says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Go ahead and be seated this morning. Thank you. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. The topic of leadership, especially in this time that we are in, is so important because leadership begins in the heart of God. And I think as a people, we have to come back to understanding the power of anointed leadership. Anointed leadership. Leadership is in the heart of God. And for a minute, I know we all have studied David and Saul. We all know the story of David and Saul. And when the Lord commanded the prophet Samuel to anoint David as king... He, he did this because Israel was in need of a leader with God's heart. Amen. David's anointing that he received at his father's house represented actually a correction in Israel's leadership choice. Whether we know it or not, we choose our leaders. Our leaders do not choose us. And when the prophet Samuel came to anoint David, the Lord himself was bringing a correction in the choice of Israel. Now, even though there is not one scripture in the Bible that ever mentioned that Saul loved God, read it. There's not one scriptural reference to the fact that Saul loved God. God was never against Saul. However, God was against Israel's reasoning for wanting a king. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, if you can just turn there very quickly. God was never against Saul. But in verse 4, it says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us, look at this, like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people and all they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which I've done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, which they had forsaken me and served other gods, so they are also doing to you. The Lord was never against Saul. He was against the fact that Israel wanted to be like everybody else. This is the reason that the church has lost its power. And we're beginning to see in the world we live how necessary the power of the Holy Spirit in our life is. You see, Israel was never called to be a natural army with chariots and bows, but the Lord formed Israel to be a spiritual army with spiritual leadership, with the power and miracles of God leading them. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter says to us, he says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Look at this, his own special people. Some scripture says a peculiar people. If you're part of Victor Outreach, quite possibly you're a very peculiar people. He says that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. How many could agree this morning that if it had not been for the Lord, we would still be lost in darkness if it had not been not only for his love, 
But if it had not been for the power of the Holy Spirit, we would not be in this place this morning. Somebody say power. power. See, we are God's own special people. And what I believe the Lord is doing at the very end of this year, going into the first part of next year, is that God is choosing leaders. He's choosing leaders. He wants to raise up leaders amongst us. But he doesn't want an ordinary leader. He wants a leader that has the spirit of David. He wants to raise up a leader that is a David, that is a man after God's own heart. I want to talk to this generation this morning. I, I feel that this spirit is, this word is stirring in my heart for a reason, because our church, the, the average age of our church is around 33 years old. We have a young church. Many of you are just coming into age. But one thing my generation learned is we learned the difference between appointed leaders and anointed leaders. We learned the difference between people who led by position and those who led under the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. Let, let's look at the difference between Saul and David for a minute. Saul, when he was anointed by Samuel, the prophet took a clay flask, filled it with oil and poured it upon his head. The clay flask was a man-made object. Because Saul was the people's choice. He was man's choice. And this clay flask represented the pressure and the desires of man. To create a, a clay flask, it must be created on a potter's wheel. With man's hands putting pressure on it. I guess the Lord was saying, is because you're putting so much pressure on me, I'm going to give you somebody. Saul was the people's choice. And Saul led with God's help for just two years. For two years, he sought the Lord. For two years, the Lord was number one in his life and number one in his leadership. But then what happened to Saul, just like happens to many people, he became proud when the Lord gave him just a little taste of success. I want to say something to this third wave generation, to those of you that are on fire for the Lord. When, when, when pride steps on stage, God steps off. In fact, the Lord hates pride. He despises pride. He opposes the efforts of the proud. And what we see in, Paul, uh, in Saul is he became so proud, he even began to cross lines he shouldn't have crossed. He consulted a medium, a fortune teller. He began to sacrifice in place of the priest. And that's when the Lord, that's when the prophet said, obedience is better than sacrifice. So the Lord lifted his favor off of Saul. But let's look at David for a minute. When the prophet anointed David, with the oil from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, he used a different vessel. With Saul, it was a clay flask representing the pressure of man and a man-made object. But when the prophet anointed David, he used a ram's horn. Where the clay flask represented man's making, the ram's horn represented God's making. The ram's horn, if you study a ram... You've seen Rams. Some of you are Rams fans. <laughs> when a Ram is fighting for territory against another male of his species, what do they do? They take those horns and they clash with their opponent. They clash with their opponent. Why did the Lord use a Ram's horn to anoint David because the ram's horn represented the aggressive strength that it takes to lead. The ram's horn represented the aggressive style that it takes to lead. 
And the ram's horn represents the authority of God that is needed in spiritual leadership, spiritual warfare, and to usher in revival. I don't know who I came to talk to this morning, but I came to tell you it's not always easy to lead. It's not always easy to, to stand in front of people. It's not always easy to stand as the voice of God. But when you have been anointed by God with a ram's horn, he fashions you as a spiritual leader. What am I saying to you this morning is the difference between an appointed leader and an anointed leader is that an anointed leader is a real leader. And I want you to know that a spiritual leader is a real leader who becomes a fashion instrument in the presence of God. What has God been doing in our midst this year? He's canceled our calendar. He's He's wiped out all of our man-made plans. Yet we still gather together on Sunday, regardless of what the government says we can and cannot do. But what are we doing? Are we here just to sing some songs and have a Bible study? Are we here just to see friends and, and just fellowship? I came to tell you, no, no, no. God always does things with a purpose. He's a God of purpose. And what the Lord has done this year is he's fashioning weapons for his glory and his honor. He's fashioning spiritual leaders. He's fashioning instruments that you are not going to come out of this year the way you came in. You're coming in with more power. You're coming out with more anointing. You're coming out with more authority. I wish I had somebody that could shout on this word. I'm going to say amen to myself. I don't know about you, but I haven't liked how this year's gone. But I can tell you one thing. It will not be wasted because I'm coming out with a greater anointing. I'm coming out with greater power. Every situation, every problem, every opposition, every sin in your life that God has dealt with. He's dealt with those sins so that God could fashion you into a spiritual warrior. He's anointed you with a ram's horn. Come on, somebody. He's begun to release something new in your life. I came to tell you, church is not a game. The Lord has a purpose for you. Yes. Saul's army, anointed with a flask, often laid back in fear of the Philistine army. You remember that he chilled out under a pomegranate tree. He refused to attack the enemy. He refused to deal with his enemies because he didn't have the real anointing. But David was anointed with a ram's horn. And it was David that put his enemy on notice. It was David that put his enemies in retreat. It was David that pushed back the Philistine army because he had the anointing and the aggressive power of the Holy Spirit in your life. I don't know who I came to talk to, but there's some of you that people are always trying to hush you down. They're always like, oh, you're too aggressive. You talk too loud. You preach too loud. You lead too hard. Listen, I came to tell you, when the anointing of God comes upon you, the spirit of a giant killer comes upon you. Woo! I believe in this season the Lord is fashioning some spiritual generals in this place. He's raising up a generation of generals. See, even Saul recognized the anointing. Even Saul recognized the difference with David's anointing and his anointing. Even Saul recognized it because he got so upset because all the sisters, and how many know the sisters, man? They could stir up a fight. <laughs> he began to get upset because all the women of the church all the women in Israel started writing songs. First Samuel 18, 7. So the women sang and they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his ten thousands. I came to tell you, there's another level of anointing. There's another level of power. There's another level of authority that God is birthing inside of you. Do I got any giant killers here this morning? Man, I'm supposed to be teaching this morning. I'm over here shouting. 
It's all got to be for something, right? We're in a time and season where, where the Lord is calling us back to anointed God-fearing leadership. He's not looking for fashion-forward leaders. He's looking for fiery leaders. Ooh. The Lord's calling us back to some stuff. He's been dealing with us, hasn't he? I believe he's recalling, he's resetting, he's renewing, and he's re-anointing leaders. Listen, David wasn't anointed once. He was anointed three times. Oh, my God. Before he came into his authority, his full, the fullness of authority, he was anointed three times. Somebody say three times. I came to tell you 2020 has been a year of a second anointing. Because God is resetting some things. God is renewing some things. God is re-anointing some leaders. His spirit is coming off Saul and it's falling on David. There's a scripture in the Bible that says the house of Saul became weaker and weaker, but the house of David became stronger and stronger. <laughs> See, not everybody's going to catch this word, but I know some of you who pray. The house of Saul became weaker and weaker, but the house of David became stronger and stronger. Hear me and hear me because there is a promise on this church. Uh, we have a promise in our ministry, but there's a promise on this church. Say, I've got a promise. And the promise says that I will multiply you and make you stronger than your enemy. I know you've been going through trials and you've been going through storms, but God is using those storms and God is using those trials to multiply you and the devil cannot stand in your way. Say, my house is getting stronger. Say it like you believe it. My house is getting strong. My goodness, I don't know where the heads of households are. I don't know where the grandparents are. I don't know where the parents are. I don't know where the leaders are. But I came to tell you, my house is getting stronger. My family is getting stronger. My children are getting strong. Oh, somebody shout in praise. A church with the real thing has no reason to fear. The church, the leader that functions under the real anointing of God has no reason to fear. But God's calling us back to godly, anointed, God-fearing leadership. Proverbs 29, 2, it says, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. But when the wicked are in authority, the, the people groan. When the wicked are in authority, the people suffer. The people are weakened. And I believe that God is raising up in our midst leaders that he wants to use. Now, I'm not going to speak much longer, but how many of you believe that God has been leaning on you? How many of you feel like God's been leaning on your leadership? How many have found yourself in situations where you didn't expect to lead, but there you are? How many have found yourself in places where you didn't expect to be in the driver's seat, but there you are? Or you weren't planning on driving. You were planning on being the passenger. You said, well, I guess I got to drive. Touch your neighbor and tell him, you're the man, you're the woman. Uh. You're the man, you're the woman, you're the one. But God, he says, I don't want to raise up the spirit of Saul. I want to raise up the spirit of David. The spirit of David. Who does God use? And then we'll pray. Number one, God-fearing leaders are what you call least likely leaders. Least likely leaders. When Samuel went to 
Jesse's house, you know the story well. He was not even chosen. Because Jesse had seven other sons that were all handsome, strong, tall, built. They all looked like Saul. And what the Lord told Samuel, he says, that's the old model. <laughs> Jesse was so proud. These are my seven sons. God says, mm -mm. we're not doing Saul over again. He said, there's another. Someone say, there's another. And David was in the shepherd field. Let me share this with you is that human promotion doesn't equal a divine call. If you look at David's story, you will find that God doesn't pick from the past. He doesn't pick from the pecking order. He picks from a person's heart. I believe there's going to be some people here, man, of you. You might be in the pecking order, but if your heart ain't right, God's going to just pass over you. Because God's not looking at who's in line with man. He's looking for those who, who are in line with him. He wants to pick a leader who is least likely. Now, I'm not trying to just feed the chip on your shoulder. I know my church. You love it. Oh, yes, the leak light of the treasure out of darkness. No, 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 no. It ain't about the fact that everybody rejected you. What are you doing in that space? God's not going to raise up a whiner and a complainer and a trickster and a person who's playing games with God. You say, well, I'm the least likely. Listen, there's millions of those. God's looking for somebody that even though man has rejected you, you are still pressing in with the Father. Come on, somebody. You say, it may not be my time now, but I'm getting ready for what God is about to do in my life. 1 Corinthians 1 27, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound, to shame the things that are wise and the weak things of the world, to shame those things that are mighty. I often ask myself, how did I get here? <laughs> how did I get here? How, how is it that I'm standing here today? How is it that God has blessed my life, blessed the work of my hands? How is it that the Lord was able to not only choose me, but Use me. I, I was not, and I'm still not the most qualified to lead. I'm not the most qualified to lead. I'm not the best speaker. There are so many gifted preachers, gifted speakers, people that are just masterful in how they bring the word and their personality is so wonderful. I'm not that. I don't have a business degree. I have a couple of diplomas, but I, I wasn't educated in the finest schools. I don't have the greatest education. So I asked myself, God, how is it that I'm here? And the Lord said to me a long time ago, he says, you're there because I saw something in you that you could not see in yourself. Amen. And you know, the person that's least likely, you know why God chooses them? He chooses them because they will give him maximum glory. Jesus. Maximum glory. Jesus. What I believe God is doing in this season right now, he, he's going to choose some of you. But he's going to choose those of you that when he starts to bless you, and he starts to raise you up. And he starts to bless the work of your hands. And when people start coming to you and trying to tell you how great you are, 
When that comes to you, instead of you taking it for yourself and taking the glory for yourself, you're going to deflect the glory to him. And you're going to say, if it had not been for the Lord, I would not be where I am at today. And that's how the Lord gets all the glory. I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, man, if God's called you and you've taken any kind of glory for yourself or any you've taken anything for yourself, understand the Lord, he knows how to keep us humble. He knows how to keep us humble. And I don't have a sermon for that right now, but I could preach a whole sermon on ways that the Lord has humbled me. Man, God will even, you know, you'll go to sit down in a chair and the chair will break in front of the whole church. God has a way of keeping somebody humble. The Lord is looking for people that are least likely but will give him all the glory. Secondly, God chooses people who are little in their own eyes. Little in their own eyes. It's humility, brokenness, a level of unworthiness. I do believe this. Just as I believe that you could be hungry and and full at the same time. That you could feel good about yourself, but still be humble. I do believe that you could still have a good self-esteem, but still be humble. You could still know that you've been fearfully and wonderfully made. That you're the head and not the tail. That from your mother's womb, he knew you. I believe that you need to have all that in your life. But even when you have that understanding, I still believe that in the midst of all that, you could still be humble. And what I really see when I look at Moses, who is the greatest deliverer, the greatest leader, educated in all the Egyptian schools, trained in war, He was broken and small in his own eyes. He was living in in exile. He was unable to speak. He was shy and timid. But that's why God chose him. Here's the key. This is the part I want you to hear. If God's going to raise up Davids in our church and anointed leaders, he's looking for people that you're not going to lean on the world's knowledge. You're not going to lean on the world's wisdom. You're not going to lean on what the Internet is feeding you. What social media is feeding you. What the news is feeding you. You're not going to lean on secular knowledge. You're going to lean on the wisdom of God. You're going to lean on the wisdom of God. See, what we need in this our are we need leaders who are going to be honest about their weaknesses you know what a, an anointed leader is it, it's someone that says i can't do this without you i can't do this without you i can't lead this family without you i can't lead this marriage without you i can't lead these children without you I can't lead this ministry without you. God, I need you. I need you. If, if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's how little we are without God. How little our leaders are without God. How little the doctors are. I mean, they've gotten up in front of the TV and they've said, we don't even know how to cure this thing. There must be a God then. There must be a God. Because I haven't gotten sick. Can I hear an amen? And every person I know that's got it 
is walking on their feet today going forward in the things of God. Come on, somebody. See, I came to tell you, it's time for leadership to stop looking to the world for direction. It's time for the people of the church to stop looking to the news for direction and stop looking to the Internet. Don't Google it. Go to God. You can't Google your destiny. You can't Google your purpose. You got to go to God for your destiny. You got to go to God for your purpose. You got to go to God for your power. We need a church that says, I won't do it unless God is in it. Lord, I'm nothing without you. I can't do anything without your power. And the final thing as they come, I believe that the Lord is moving right now in a way that we may not be aware. God uses least likely leaders, leaders who are little in their own view, and then he, look, he, he uses those who lean constantly on him. Lean constantly on him. This year, let me ask you, how many of you have learned to lean on him for everything? Right? For everything. You get up in the morning, you know, standing sideways because you're looking for God so you can lean on him. I was reading a book the other day, an old book from the 50s, and they said, you know, so many people say Christianity is a crutch. And the writer says, thank God for that crutch. Come on, somebody. Because if I didn't have that crutch, I would have fallen down. I, I think you should say it proudly and loudly. Jesus is my crutch. Where's your crutch? Oh, that's why you on the floor. He wants to raise up some people that lean on his power. He wants to raise up some people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. But hear this part. He wants to raise up people that are not just filled with the Spirit, but are familiar with the strength of the Spirit-filled life. Now watch. He wants to bring into position leaders who've experienced how the Holy Ghost moves. That when the Holy Ghost moves... They can explain it. <laughs> the Bible says when the Holy Ghost fell in the upper room and they were all filled and Peter preached the first sermon, right? All Peter did was go up there, watch this, and explain to the people what was going on. <laughs> That's how our preaching should be. I'm not trying to preach you into your destiny. I'm just explaining what the Holy Ghost is doing in your life. I'm not trying to force you into where God wants you to be. The Holy Ghost is already taking you there. When I show up, I'm just saying, this is why. <laughs> he said, brothers and sisters, these guys aren't drunk. They're full of the power of God. And the Lord wants to raise up leaders in this church that understand the spirit-filled life. They understand how the Holy Ghost moves, that when the Holy Ghost is moving in our midst, you can say, this is what God is doing, and this is what God is doing, and this is what God is doing. He wants you to be spirit-led. What is a spirit-led leader? It's somebody that has seen miracles. 
They've seen miracles. They don't know the God that just saved them. They know the God that even after serving him for 20 years, he's still doing miracles in your life. Oh, come on, somebody. He wants to raise up leaders that they can still see the power of the Holy Ghost moving in every situation. He wants to raise up leaders that don't just quote the word, they've experienced the word. He wants to raise up leaders that they know what it is for God to shut one door and open another one. He wants to raise up leaders that have seen bodies healed. That quite possibly even their own body has been healed. He wants to raise up leaders that don't just know the Lord of salvation, but they know the Lord of provision. See, I got some leaders that you know what I'm talking about. He, he, he wants to raise up, what am I trying to say? Not people with titles. He wants to raise up people where the power of the Holy Spirit is actually moving through you. That the Spirit of God becomes so strong on you. And the anointing becomes so strong on you that wherever you go, something has to change. That they don't invite you to Thanksgiving dinner. Because you know that the turkey won't be the only thing that's hot. <laughs> Somebody say power. power. Somebody say power. power. There's a difference. When Paul went to Ephesus for the first time, the Bible says he ran into some disciples. Imagine that, disciples. Somebody say disciples. And he asked them a question. He says, have you been baptized? Have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? And you know what they said to him? We had not even heard there was a Holy Spirit. And then Paul gets perplexed. Just like I get perplexed when I get up here sometimes. <laughs> he says, then what baptism do you have? He goes, well, we have the baptism of John. John the Baptist. Where John was just dunking people in water. But even John said, I baptize you in water. But there one's coming that's going to baptize you in fire. <laughs> Come on, somebody. There's one coming that's going to baptize you in the fire and the power and the anointing. He's coming with a ram's horn. Come on, somebody. And he's looking for somebody that he can anoint. He's looking for somebody that he could feel all over again. He's looking for somebody that he could renew. He's looking for somebody that the devil tried to kill you, but he said, once my power touches you, you are coming back to life. He wants to revive you. He wants to stir you. He wants to dip you in his power this morning. I'm going to need somebody to give God praise. If you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. But once you tasted of him, you said there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more power. There's got to be more anointing. There's got to be more. I came to tell you God's not done with us yet. He's just getting started in this place. But he's looking for somebody this morning that you're going to begin to rise up and say, Lord, anoint me. Lord, fill me. Lord, 
open up heaven over my life. I want the power of the Holy Spirit once again. What does it take? How many of you want the Holy Ghost? How many say, I'm not satisfied? Satisfaction is the enemy of revival. How many say, I want to be like that widow who went and got all the pots? Who got all the pots? Well, I'll tell you the, the way to get the Holy Spirit in greater measure. There's only one way. Someone say one way. You got to humble yourself. You got to humble yourself. You've got to say, Lord, to go higher, I got to go lower. To go farther, I got to dig deeper. See, you'll, you'll lose a group. You'll lose a group. Because everybody, they, you know, they got that welfare mentality. They want everything for free. Now, let me tell you, salvation's free, but the anointing's going to cost you something. <laughs> salvation's free, but the, the power of the Holy Ghost is going to cost you something. He wants to anoint you to lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. He wants to ignite you and give you the spirit of breakthrough that every time you open up your mouth, chains begin to fall off people's lives. Come on, somebody salvation is free but if you want the power of the holy spirit you've got to humble yourself you've got to pick up your shovel and you've got to dig until you hit water until the rain begins to fall and the flood begins to rise i don't know if there's anybody here this morning but you say hey i'm not leaving this place until i get the anointing that i came for When you humble yourself, and you get low, Come on. real low, so low, and your face is on the floor. That's when God says, they're ready. They're ready. What I believe God is going to do in this new season is he's going to strengthen you so that you can humble yourself. Second Chronicles 69. So powerful. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. He's looking. Who could I anoint? Who could I strengthen? Who could I give another measure of power? Who could I raise up? Who could I use? This one stopped praying. This one stopped coming to church. This one gave up on me. This one went to the world. This one got beat up by the enemy. This one fled from my call. This one ran. This one dismissed himself. But so, so now God's saying, he's looking to and fro. Who could I anoint? Who could I anoint? Who could I anoint? Who, who's next? Who's next? Who's next? Who's next? Who's ready? 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 
Lift your hands in this place. Who's ready? Say, Lord, use my life. Anoint me. I feel a freshness about to hit this room right now. There's a freshness. There's a fresh wind, a fresh oil. Heaven is open in this place. We humble ourselves before you. We humble ourselves before you this morning. Tehillah, mm. mm. sing to the Lord, worship Him right now. Oh, just you and God, right? Now. You and the Lord, right now. He's raising up righteous leadership in this place so that his people might rejoice. Revival leadership, restored leadership, renewed leadership. Mm -hmm. Talk to him. The oil is being poured out right now. How desperate are you? I can't go forward without the oil. I can't go forward without the fresh anointing. Mmm. Oh, We like to speak in tongues in this church. We believe that it's the perfect prayer. Don't don't let it push you away. Draw in. Oh. Come on, right now, the annoying...